Hi, I'm Poe Bronson. I'm the managing director of Indie Bio, and this is our demo day here in San Francisco. I'm holding the New York Times up from this morning to show you indeed that we are live, <laughs> and everything you're going to see today is live. Uh, our founders will be pitching from, uh, we are here in the Indie Bio office places on Jesse Street in the south of Market neighborhood. And uh, our founders will be pitching just off to the side here. About half of our founders will be pitching remotely from their workspaces and labs around the world. And let's just start with a little housekeeping. So we're going to be going for about 90 minutes. And then after that, we'll be convening in a community platform called Rally. We'll teach you more about that afterwards. And let's just start out with down in the corner, you see the test tube? I want you to click on that test tube. Click on that test tube and make little test tube emojis float up. And then to the right, there should be a little Petri dish. And to the left, an exploding head. We hope we explode your heads today with all of the solutions we are creating for the challenges the world is facing. Now, for all of the investors who are watching, you should be on a slightly separate page than the rest of the general public. If you scroll down, you should see all sorts of goodies pitch decks, videos, articles, and the ability to book time right now with all of the founders who are pitching. If you don't see that, if you scroll down and you don't see that, you're on the wrong page. What we recommend you do is go back to the Eventbrite page and uh, make sure you buy a ticket. We'll quickly vet that you're indeed an investor and email you in under a minute the correct link. Or just text your friends. I'm sure your friends are watching. Now, uh, please keep the emojis going because these founders built their startups during this pandemic. And it was as hard as it's ever been. Always a hard journey was made worse by being locked out of their labs and their workshops in May and in June and getting things going. And then once things were going, they were still struggling through vendor delays and IRB delays and shipping delays. So, uh, we have a little pre-roll video here for you from the workplaces of our startups around the world. And let's cue that video up now. And when it plays, please use those emojis to show them, show them some love. Thank you. I made an innovation of microbial stem cells. Such phenomenon does not exist in nature. We are developing a real-time pathogen detection system. This is a $77 billion a year problem with over 40,000 people being hospitalized. This is our product. We make organic plant growth stimulants and plant disease control products. I'm Agustina Spiros, founder and CTO of Microgenesis. Our fundamental insight is that infertility is due to an intestinal condition and dysbiosis of fertility biome. We are here to change the industry. I work as a software developer here. I am a hardware developer for EcoLessence. I'm the CSO of Asimica. During our time in the IndieBio program, we tested several products and observed higher and longer production when our microbial stem cells were introduced. We are more than science. We are a team. We are microgenesis. And our time has just begun. We're very excited about turning all of this waste into fuel. Exactly. We're going to slam our transducer in the top of that, so we'll have to wait for this to cool down so that we can see what we made. We are here to celebrate the christening of our first prototype. Hi, I want to thank the team at Casper Biotech for providing the testing for everybody who's come to Jesse Street today, all of our founders, everybody on our staff. I'm Poe Bronson. As the managing director, I want to introduce our team. Uh, we'll start with Wesley over here. Hi, I'm Wesley. I'm the operations analyst. Prichit? Hi, I'm Prichit. I'm the principal. 
Uh, I'm Alex, Senior Director and one of the partners. Hi, I'm Arvind Gupta. I'm the founder of IndieBio and now Venture Advisor. Hi, I'm June Axip, Chief Science Officer and Partner at IndieBio. Hi, I'm Maya Lockwood. I'm Head of IndieBio Investor Relations. Hi, I'm Pei, I'm CTO and partner at SOSV. Okay, for a quick introduction, you wanna bring up that slide? So 2020 has been a big year for IndieBio. Uh, our alumni have been really growing fast and this year they've raised over a billion dollars in follow-on capital. We've had 27 rounds and here at IndieBio, we've deployed twice as much capital as any year before. We hired the New York team and opened our New York location just three days before the pandemic sent everyone home. To Sam, in San Francisco, we recruited Pei and Wes. And when COVID hit, we created a task force with Sean O'Sullivan and made eight investments. By April, one of those investments, Renegade Bio, was testing everyone at the UN. And we're extremely proud to announce that ANA Therapeutics has had its first inpatient for its phase two, three trial of meclosamide. We were named, surprisingly, the U.S.'s most active early stage investor in the second quarter. And we thought that might be a blip, but then we were again named the most active investor in the U.S. for Q3. Which isn't slowing down. We have seven more Series A rounds launching in the next few months, and we're bringing in some amazing companies for our next batches. Take it away, June. So we had to run our first virtual batch these last few months. And while the core components of our program translated well, we do miss the spontaneous interactions of us together in our labs. Most of the teams stayed in their home cities and found space locally, and a couple of our team did relocate to San Francisco to use our labs. We will be running the next batch with this hybrid model as well, and applications are now open for our next batch that starts in January. But there is some silver lining, which Pei will tell you about. One of the silver linings to this unfortunate remote scenario is that while literal boundaries have hardened, figurative ones have all but melted away. Time zones are nearly meaningless now for those of us who are fortunate enough to make the transition to fully remote work at the flip of a switch. IndieBio already had a global purview and reach, but now more than ever, we can act on that global reach and work closely with our global investing syndicate, all while delivering a rich slate of programming for our non-Bay Area companies. We've had investors come in for sneak peeks and feedback sessions from all over the globe, Switzerland, Dubai, Hong Kong, and so on. And at all hours of the day and night, our founders were calling in from Oxford to Ontario, Laramie and Buenos Aires in Mumbai. And even our own team was scattered around the globe as the whole indie bio community found itself caught up in the ever shifting border policies and travel restrictions. This has been a truly global effort to get these 11 companies on an accelerated path to market and ultimately to effect positive change for human and planetary health. For more on our mission around human and planetary health, here's Maya. Yes. Well, while all of this was happening, it's very exciting to announce that Poe, our managing director, and Arvind, IndieBio's founder and now venture advisor, wrote a book called Decoding the World. This is very exciting because it details the quest to live a meaningful life and to contribute in a powerful way and how biotech plays a big part of building our future. It's a must read. It has been called a revolution of the mind by Biotechnica. It is number one new book in biotech and the number one new book in free enterprise and capitalism. You can find a copy at Amazon and you can even read the first few chapters for free. Next up, we have a special surprise for our founders. Anytime in three, two. I'm not ready. <laughs> oh, I think what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> Do you want me to go? Yes, yeah. Oh. Do I just go? Hey. Wow. Hey. Wow. Demo day. Uh, I remember that time. Congrats to everybody for getting here. This is so exciting. You're going to kill it. Do well. Hey, everyone. Good luck today. Be cheering for you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hello. Inya here from New Culture. Matt. 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> you see, just not laughing. Hey, in the bio, to all of you new founders, good luck on Demo Day. Hi, everyone. This is Matias from Reflow. I'm Maria Solovecha, co-founder and CEO of Syntax in the bio batch three. Hello, IndieBio SF Class 10 and New York Class 1, the first. Amazing for you guys. Just wanted to wish everybody pitching today best of luck. We wish you a lot of luck and um, this is going to be a, a great experience. So have fun and um, just enjoy for all the hard work that you put in. Whoa! It's been hard months with a lot of hassle from your side, but Demo Day has arrived. We wish you all the best and enjoy the moment. Have fun. Through COVID and all this, you did it, you made it through. Hi everyone, Tammy and I and the whole team at Hue just want to wish you the best of luck in Demo Day. Hey everyone, good luck on Demo Day. I'm really excited to see what all of you are about to do. Hey everyone, best of luck on Demo Day. Best to all of you and good health. You know, a good indie bio demo day is like part uh, a miraculous discovery and part a science experiment run wild and part, uh, you know, a, just a new moment of hope for the human race. Congrats, everyone. And, you know, you may think the roller coaster is coming to an end, but I guarantee it's just beginning. Good luck to all the teams in both New York and in San Francisco. Kim and Josh from Prime Roots wishing you a great demo day. Awesome. That was really good. I think you nailed it. And now for the true stars of the show. First off, we have microgenesis. A new area we invested in this batch is fertility. And after monitoring the space for years, we invested in not one, but two fertility companies. It's great to see so many startups coming into the space to democratize and increase accessibility, but we believe that true innovation is in the biology of fertility. Microgenesis not only created a precision diagnostic, but a treatment for infertility. Take it away, Gabby. Hi everyone, I'm Gabby, the CEO of Microgenesis. We created the technology that will change fertility industry for women and couples everywhere. We have been working during the last two years with the most complex fertility cases. Now we are bringing down our innovation to OBGYNs and direct to consumers. At certain age, women start to wonder, how fertile am I? Do I need to start now? Whether they go to the OBGYN or their buy online, the standard test only measures five hormones, indicators of ovary function. But this is a really old test, and fertility is very important to rely on a 30-year-old test. We pretend to replace this traditional test for a far better one, the one that diagnoses the real problem and tells us how to fix it. Women have heard that they cannot get pregnant because of their age. At microgenesis, we detangle age from inflammation. Our fundamental insight is that infertility is due to the dysbiosis of a fertility biome. When functional microorganisms are missing, immune cells get depolarized and attack the intestinal barrier, leading to autoimmunity, metabolic syndrome, and endometriosis. To evaluate a fertility biome, women send us one swab. We analyze their biome using real-time PCR to hunt for microRNA signatures. MicroRNAs are the functional markers of the dysbiosis. Combined with the information we get from a blood test, we categorize patients into 64 discrete phenotypes. During the next 90 days, women are sent nutraceuticals, probiotics, and recommendations for changing what they eat. We have 53 treatment combinations tailored to these 64 phenotypes, and it is free of prescription drugs. This is important not only because women prefer natural solutions. This is important because drugs screw up the microbiome, the very thing we need to fix. We have treated over 300 women, but it is important to understand that we didn't start with the typical cases. We ran our clinical study on women like Christina. After 11 years trying to get pregnant, and eight expensive failed in vitro fertilization procedures, Christina was suffering. We diagnosed her through a swab test, 
and we treated her with our customized nutraceutical diet. 90 days later, she was expecting her first baby, Emma. Christina was just one of the 287 patients in our clinical study across Spain and Argentina. All of them were suffering. They had all failed, not one, not two, but four in vitro fertilization procedures. And within six months, 75% got pregnant. Amazingly, 32 out of these women got pregnant spontaneously without in vitro fertilization. During the last year, we extended our study to a fertility clinic in Zaragoza, Spain. Spain is the second biggest fertility market in the world. Now, 10 out of 11 women are pregnant. We extend our clinical study with an extra package of 106 couples at Wayne State University Medical Center in Detroit. This branch of the study is being run by Dr. Gilmore, the president of the American Society of Reproductive Immunology. I've known Gil for 15 years. At Yale, he was a pioneer studying the role of microbes in reproductive immunology. Fertility affects 15% of all couples, but there is no reason for women to wait until they have failed in vitro fertilization procedures to come to microgenesis. We are confident we can help far more women who are at the start of the journey. Women like Silvina, who was our very first alpha tester in our consumer-oriented D2C service. During Indivio, we have treated 15 women, and 14 out of them are already pregnant, like Silvina. Now, we have moved to the United States. We will do alpha testing in a CLIA lab in Oakland next month. We already have our first four consumers lined up. During the next six months, we will do soft launch, both online and through OBGYNs. We will help them to treat their patients and we will refer patients to them. We estimate charging $400 for the test and $200 per month for the nutraceuticals and probiotics. Our probiotic blend supplier is Saco System. Our nutraceutical supplier is Equinox. In our website, we are working with Woolmetrics, which is an international expert in consumer healthcare IT. Because we are in a CLIA operating lab, we don't need any regulatory approval to launch and sell our service. But regulatory approval will make our service reimbursable by insurers, so women don't have to pay it out of pocket. We expect the clinical study at Wayne State enable our approval in 18 months. Our algorithm diagnostic engine holds 15 years spent in investigating more than 3,000 complex fertility cases. Our intellectual property strategy is to patent microRNA tests and keep nutraceuticals and probiotic tailored formulation for fertility as a trade secret. Microgenesis team has more than 15 years spent in the research, innovation, and development in fertility. Our advisors include international experts in the field of business, science, and intellectual property protection. Ask yourself, would you use the same old test that doesn't predict and doesn't help, or would you use the one that gets results, results that even fertility clinics cannot? In our future roadmap, we have a male partner test, and our vision extends beyond the birth of a baby. We will hand on our customers to make their sure their babies have healthy biomes. We welcome you to join us in bringing healthy babies from healthy families. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, for that. For all of y'all who are visiting us through the investor portal, please remember to scroll down and take a look at some of the other materials that you can see from Microgenesis, including a link to book an appointment with the team. Next up, we have Jamil Feshitan, CEO and co-founder of Advanced Microbubbles. Jamil's team has a unique approach to creating their macrobubbles that make the impenetrable penetrable. You may think that you've heard this microbubble story before, 
But Advanced Microbubbles is here to show us a new path with their patented approach. Please welcome Jamil Feshitin and Advanced Microbubbles. Thank you very much for the introduction, P. Hello, I'm Jamil, co-founder and CEO of Advanced Microbubbles and a biocolors expert. My team aims to solve that age-old problem in cancer chemotherapy where less than 1% of injected drugs can penetrate a tumor owing to biological barriers such as the blood-brain barrier or the tumor endothelium barrier. And this contributes to another problem where the high doses of chemo needed to kill the tumor is just so toxic that it's killing the patient as well. But we have a powerful solution. The use of ultrasound-triggered microbubbles proven to be safe for diagnostic imaging, which we've now optimized to solve cancer drug delivery. Let's take a look at how it works. It's very simple. Our proprietary microbubbles are injected into the systemic circulation together with the drug of choice, which can be either co-injected with the microbubbles or sequentially injected with the bubbles. Now, our microbubbles are designed to last up to 30 minutes in circulation. At the specific site of the disease, on the ultrasound, the microbubbles will vibrate rapidly at the frequency of the ultrasound, expanding and shrinking to create powerful mechanical and fluid forces that overcomes the biological barriers and pumps the circulating drugs deep into the disease site in a manner that is simultaneously safe, non-invasive, and targeted. Now, Many researchers and companies have been trying to use microbubbles as a companion drug therapeutic, but they all started out with the conventional diagnostic imaging bubbles, which aren't very stable in circulation and are widely heterogeneous in size, leading to an inconsistent acoustic response for drug delivery translation. So they eventually reach out to us. The reason is we are the only company in the world that makes the holy grail in microbubble engineering a microbubble that is both stable in circulation for up to 30 minutes and also uniform in size, our proprietary monodispersed size isolated microbubbles. With the predictable acoustic response of the same bubbles, we can now control cancer drug delivery, allowing for up to 50 times greater drug uptake to the tumor site, consistent and reproducible drug dosing at the tumor site, and the ability to significantly reduce drug dosing, which will help mitigate the side effects of chemotherapy. Our collaborators at NIH NIDA published a proof of concept showing the power of the same bubbles. In this study, the target was the rat brain. The image you're looking at is the control rat after injection of a fluorescent drug alone. But as you can see, there's not really much penetration of the drug into the disease site. But when you compare it to the use of the drug and our technology, voila can see clear penetration of the drug at the targeted region. And this was at least tenfold greater than with the use of the conventional microbubble sizes. Now this study led to a lot of excitement as it proves that the poor drug penetration problem can be solved using our microbubbles as compared to the conventional diagnostic imaging bubbles, leading to an LOI from InsideTech for clinical translation. But for us, the next step was to prove that we can treat cancer in a much safer manner which is much easier to do in an abdominal cancer model. An example of this is neuroblastoma, a rare disease, a tumor that develops in adrenal glands and our first clinical indication. At IndieBio, we've been generating proof of concept to use the highly chemotoxic drug, l drugs to treat this disease. Folks, in spite of the challenges of working during this ongoing COVID crisis, we are very pleased to show some exciting preliminary results. For the first time, we were able to halt tumor growth using a very low and safe dose of chemotherapy, one mg per kg, all without any observable side effects to the specimen, such as loss of weight or loss of motor function. This was not possible using that low dose chemotherapy alone. This holds promising clinical implications as it means chemo can change from what it is today with its terrible side effects to one way envision it could be. We may finally have an ability to kill the cancer without killing the patient. We hope to expand on this study and then follow it up in a pancreatic cancer model, a highly lethal form of cancer. 
Right now, our micro bubbles are being made in a laboratory grade facility. But in order to meet regulatory demand for them, we'll be pursuing the 505B2 regulatory pathway, which allows us to leverage the safety data of existing drugs to be used in combination with our technology. And it means that we don't have to duplicate expensive clinical trials. By combining this pathway with the orphan drug pathway, we believe we can cut our time to market to three to four years. So our platform strategy is to market our sim bubbles as a companion therapeutic for a wide range of injectable chemotoxic drugs. We will start out by pursuing the rare disease and hard to drug tumors, and then expand to more prevalent cancers like breast and prostate cancer. And then later on expand to other diseases like diabetes. We believe we can charge a premium for our procedure based on expected cost savings to the patients and to the clinics. Finally, along our pathway to the clinics, we intend to partner with pharma to enable the safety and efficacy of their library of old and new drug classes. We can also develop new drug chemical entities for pharma that will leverage our microbial technology for superior drug performance. With that being said, I would like to introduce our team, which consists of a unique combination of expertise in microbubble and ultrasound terranostics, which have at least five years' experience in the field and hail from the same microbubble research lab. I have 13 years' experience myself and a PhD in chemical engineering. My co-founder, Konos Lagos, is also a chemical engineer and is an expert on microbubble, click chemistry, and scale up on the GLP. Dr. Shushank Sirsi is a professor of biomedical engineering and an expert on ultrasound guided drug delivery with microbubbles. We are supported by an excellent advisory board consisting of Steve Tyrell, who's experienced getting drugs approved with the FDA, and Dr. Badri Rangarajan, a pharma veteran and a rare disease expert. Thank you for listening. I have been Jamil Feshitan with Advanced Microbubbles, and together we can make an impact in the lives of future cancer patients. Now, NIDA has been struggling for years to get consistent dosing with their conventional bubbles. Jamil and his team solved it in just three months. Not only that, his approach uses a tool that exists in every clinic today, the humble ultrasound. And that is what makes his bubbles truly incomparable. Now, with me, I have Gabby Gutierrez, CEO of Microgenesis, who just gave the kickoff pitch. Gabby, how do you feel right now? I'm so great. I'm so happy to be here in San Francisco in person. Nice. Now, uh, in the past five months of Indie Bio, what has been the most exciting moment for you? Well, for sure, there was the pregnancies during the pandemic. I used to work with mice at the beginning of my career, but now I can see our science from the eyes of every microgenesis baby. I'm so happy. Amazing. Thank you, Gabby. Now, next up, Everyone's been talking about alternative proteins for foods, but no one's been talking about alternative proteins for materials, except for Spintex. All the way from across the pond is Alex Greenhalgh to tell you more. Take it away, Alex. Thank you very much, Wesley. And hello, everyone. A very warm welcome from a rather wet and cold England. I'm Alex Greenhalgh. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spintex, a spin-out for the Silk Group at Oxford that uses nature's inspiration to spin the next generation of sustainable fibers. Our fibers are a fraction of the width of your hair. And although we're a young company, we can already produce thousands of meters of beautiful and high quality silk fibers with great properties. Based on this, the fashion industry has rushed to partner with us. Silk is a major material in fashion, and represents over $17 billion in market value in a rapidly expanding global market scape, with a particular future growth expected in Asia. But for 100 years, innovation has stagnated within the industry. The machines that made kimonos 100 years ago are the same that make silk ties today. And silk manufacturers need for hugely inefficient water baths, heating water to boiling in the order of thousands of liters results in an environmental impact that is second only to leather. Without innovation, wastewater runoff, massive CO2 production and chemical consumption will slow Silk's future applications and its growth. But nature shows us an alternative way through the spinning of the humble spider. 
Inside every spider, a liquid silk solution made of just water and protein waits to be pulled into a fiber, an incredibly low energy approach that produces the world's toughest fibers. Replicating this process would reduce energy consumption dramatically in textiles, whilst providing even greater material properties. Now you may think you've heard this story before. In the last decade, at least five major startups have tried to unravel nature's secret by copying the amino acid sequence of the spider silk. Their numerous partnerships confirm there is massive unserved demand for the idea. But Spintex is different from them in a really fundamental way. Our competitors are all trying to synthesize their spider proteins using bioreactors. This is a long and complex process that can't effectively reproduce the spider's protein. The proteins produced in their bioreactors are just too small to be spun into quality silk, and the processing is far too harsh. Our unique approach starts by taking large and readily available alternative proteins and bringing them into a solution through some gentle green chemistry to form our biomimetic liquid silk that acts just like the spiders and is cost-effective, plentiful, and most importantly, scalable. At Spintex, we use this biomimetic liquid silk to spin our fibers. All it takes is the tiniest pool to trigger an amazing self-assembly process. This non-toxic and water-based approach can produce unlimited lengths of beautiful filaments. And running at room temperature, this low energy process converts the liquid into a strong and durable fiber, just like the spider, with water the only byproduct. And we found that our approach means that we can match and even surpass premium silks and begin to approach even spider silk performance, particularly in the property of toughness. And most excitingly, we can offer something truly unique in the field. Using our own in-house spinning machinery, we can, without any chem chemical modification or post-processing, produce a variety of fibers with drastically different properties on the fly, just by pressing a button. These impressive possibilities have led to a project with one of the world's most famous fashion houses to run tests and make woven textiles using our materials. And we have further early conversations with other major brands from luxury to performance apparel. And just in the last few months, a major performance textile company after having tested our fibers has begun discussions for further collaboration and projects. These brands and organizations are so excited because they've been promised a new sustainable biotech approach to silk for years, which hasn't materialized due to costs and issues with production. The pressure to reduce impact is increasing on all sides, particularly from their customers, who are demanding lower impact clothing but without compromising on quality or on price. And even now, we are far more cost-effective than our peers, with consumables that see dramatic and rapid price reduction when bought at scale. Our spinning machinery, although bespoke, is extremely cost-effective, removing the need for massive capex investments seen with bioreactors. We predict cost parity with commercial silts can be reached at the one to 10 ton point, an order of magnitude lower than any of our competitors. And our capacity to control fiber properties on the fly, unheard of in natural textiles, will take us into exciting and disruptive markets by increasing material performance through a spider-inspired development pathway. These unique processes are currently protected by trade secrets with a strong and refined IP portfolio to follow through the formation of new and unique materials for advanced markets. Before founding Spintex, I worked in silk research for over six years at the University of Oxford, which is where I met my co-founder, Martin Friedrich, who's a material scientist and engineering expert, particularly in biopolymer fabrication, as we worked together as part of a European project based on finding out how spiders spin their silk. We're further supported by an advisory team of some of the top minds in business development, silk, and natural materials. Our IP advisor, Rob Harrison, who was formerly head of IP development at Gore, has worked with numerous startups on their business development and brings a wealth of knowledge in textiles. Our scientific advisors include Chris Holland, who heads the Natural Materials Group in Sheffield, and Fritz Volrath of the University of Oxford, with over 250 published papers on silk. And to date, we've been supported to the tune of $655,000 in capital, as well as through several amazing grant and prize opportunities. 
We've also seen great media interest from a variety of fields, showing there is still a super strong appetite for new solutions in this space. Our next 18 months includes working with our fashion partner, lining up projects with others, refining and improving our materials to generate new IP for the next step in our industrial scale up that will allow for co-branding opportunities and finally a limited release of co-branded garments by 2022. These impressive possibilities have led to a project with one of the world's most famous fashion houses to run tests and make woven textiles using our materials. And we have further early conversations with other major brands from luxury to performance apparel. And I hope you will join us in our journey to reimagine silk. Thank you for listening. Great pitch, Alex. And for our audience, there's more. After the event, if you scroll down, you will find a link where Alex shows us his liquid silk and how he makes fibers out of them. Compelling video. And before you go there, I want to call on Jamil. Hey, Jamil, come walk in. Great pitch, congrats. Thank you. Let's Perfect. take you back to a younger version of yourself at Columbia University when you were a grad student and you had just come across and invented these special bubbles. What, what advice would you give yourself, your younger self back then? That's an, that's an excellent question, Bert. Shit. Well, I'll tell that young man, you know, you have a very powerful technology mm -hmm. you're working on that has so many unique applications. You can be pulled in so many different directions, mm -hmm. but you need to remember, focus is key. Think about where you can make the biggest impact and then head in that, that direction. And then I'll tell him to buckle up and enjoy the ride. <laughs> buckle up and enjoy the ride. Lovely. Thank you, Jamil. Thank you, Bertrand. Well, I want to now bring on our next founder. He taught me a surprising fact. I learned how despite the crazy amounts of food innovation and the demand for clean green food, only 1.5% of arable land has transitioned into sustainable organic agriculture. So next up, Sumit will walk us through Reasant, his company, and how they're supercharging organic agriculture. Take it away, Sumit. Thank you, Parikshit. Hi, I'm Sumit Verma, CEO and co-founder of Reagent. Reagent is an agriculture technology company. We make agriculture sustainable and efficient. In 1971, then US Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Bird, expressed these harsh words. Before we go back to organic agriculture in this country, somebody must decide which 50 million Americans we are going to let starve or go hungry. The skepticism about organic agriculture is still prevails. It's inefficient. Despite its environmental health and societal benefits, organic agriculture occupies only 1.5% of global agricultural land. I worked in the chemicals industry for over 10 years, and I knew how desperate farmers were for better organic solutions. Reagent is on a mission to satisfy that huge need. Our product is a soil additive that can be sold either crystallized or condensed in water. It's no more expensive than the existing treatments it will replace. We will sell directly to large growers and through distributors to a small growers. We have four greenhouse trials work, uh, underway, working with agriculture universities and field trials to follow. These trials are with soybean, kale, Wheat, and we have already completed our trial in peanuts. In these trials, we are going head to head with products from companies that investors know very well. Pivot, Indigo, Syngenta, Concentric Ag, and so on. And we are confident we have a superior product. We also have a scale-up partnership with the fermentation company Osprey Biotechnics. We have also initiated partnerships with many large agriculture companies. We have really been successful opening those doors. And we have LOIs with several ag networks and companies eager to test reagent in field trials. So what's our secret to this rapid success? Our fundamental insight hacks into the idea that every plant has evolved to move and find optimum soil. Their genetic mechanisms, their immune system, their upregulation of genes, all hunt for the signal, this is the place. 
This is the place to grow. Plants get this signal from metabolites that come off soil bacteria. Our competitors over the last couple of decades have tried to improve this natural process by concentrating soil bacteria, but that approach is missing something. What we discovered is that soil bacteria have what you might think of as two circuits for growth signaling metabolites. Conventional organic soil supplements were turning only one of these circuits on. The second circuit was off. We discovered that about 15 genes in soil bacteria are co-regulated and they activate in the presence of a particular natural compound. By including that compound in our mix, our soil bacteria switch on their second circuit and crops grow far better. We have filed patents on this mechanism on four continents. Our European patent has been granted and this bodes well for us because European patent review is much more stringent than in North America. You can see reagents impact in the roots as well as overall growth of our crops. This peanut trial was performed in uh, Alabama and we were going head to head against a conventional farmer product. In this trial, plant dry weight, which is an indication of plant growth increased by up to 30%. You can see how much deeper and thick our roots are that peanut plant has really found its home in the Alabama soil. And here is our soybean root from a greenhouse trial at Auburn. As you can see, the soybean treated with reagent had a huge increase in the number of root nodules. When roots have sufficient nodules, uh, plants get the required nutrition, optimizing plant growth and produce per acre. Now, I said we found this about 15 co-regulating genes in soil bacteria, but that soil bacteria isn't one strain, it's over 100 strains, all of whom have those 15 genes. This means our approach will work with over 100 different growth promoting strains of bacteria. And in turn, this will allow us to target hundreds of different crops something that's been very important to growers as well as ag networks. The $200 billion agro inputs market is largely agrochemicals based and biologicals has a very small share in it. By covering all major crops, reagent will help farmers all over the world scale organic agriculture in a manner that is acceptable to the growers, the consumers and the environment. We have a stellar team with experience in scientific research as well as its commercialization. Professor Frederick Srienk has three decades of experience in bioengineering and biomaterials. He developed technology to optimize bacterial fermentation. Dr. G.L. Rao is a plant biotechnologist with academic and industrial experience in the development of plant biostimulant formulation. formulation. I worked in the chemicals industry for over 10 years in technology commercialization, marketing, and sales. And in our advisory team, we have experts from academia and industry. Dave Wardner, a former executive of Indigo, Corteva, and Monsanto, advises us on our go-to-market strategy and has helped us in building our distribution partnership. Uh, Professor Mark Lyles helps us in trials and product optimization. And David, Professor David Muller is a soil ex science expert and precision agriculture expert. He is helping us build our soil expertise that will give us a competitive advantage in the market. Our next 18 months includes scaling up our production with a fermentation partner and conducting field trials in North America and Brazil. Reagent is on a mission to make agriculture sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Um, and as he mentioned, over the next couple of months, they're going to be getting uh, data from their soybean, wheat, kale, and tomato trials. So make sure to talk to him uh, to learn more. 
Um, and next up, I'm going to introduce uh, a really interesting new company we found. Um, and for the last couple of years, the IndieBio team has been looking at new ways to do carbon utilization and sequestration. And uh, last summer, Arvind went to Iceland to study how they do geologic sequestration. And then not long after, I met an entrepreneur who had a really new and unique way to supercharge that approach to clean up the cement industry. Um, after a couple phone calls, we knew that we had to give this idea a chance to see the light of day. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce Quincy, the CEO of Carbix, to tell you more. Thanks for that introduction, Alex. I'm Quincy Sammy, and our company, Carbix, is capturing CO2 and turning it into stone. Not just any stone, specifically carbonates, the mineral grit that becomes the bulk of raw material for cement and concrete products. And our entire process is carbon negative. Our first pilot project is with Everest Energy Partners in Dallas, Texas. They own and operate over 112 wells and platforms in the Fort Worth and Arcoma Basin. They have a greenhouse gas problem, so we're gonna make them carbon negative cement so that they can cap old wells that are leaking methane. We visited the site recently and we look forward to starting this pilot project as soon as next month. We're also looking forward to being listed on Puro.Earth for pre-sales. This is the world's first B2B carbon credit exchange. At this site, emitters can purchase our carbon credits for prices upwards of $80 per metric ton. We've also been in continuous dialogue with multinational cement and concrete ready mix producers like Dangote West Africa and Mitsubishi Cement Company. Interestingly enough, the Japanese government has strict mandates for cement and concrete ready mix producers that they reduce their CO2 emissions by 30% by 2030. For direct air capture, our license partner is Mission Zero based in the United Kingdom. And we also look forward to working with smaller producers in the kitchen and countertop space to produce hybrid quartz carbonate countertops. Here's what has cement and concrete companies excited about what we're doing. It's the amount of CO2 that we can uptake per ton or per yard of concrete and the speed at which we can do it. For comparison, Carbon Cure is a 13-year-old company in our space. Our process results in a 3x more increase in CO2 and as a result, a 7x increase in the net CO2 over the product life cycle. Also, a higher rate of carbonation results in more revenue streams from subscription exchanges and credits. Now let's talk about speed. This is the Carbix X1 reactor coming out of final assembly and functional test. In nature, CO2 will turn to stone naturally over about a thousand years. In certain projects where CO2 is piped underground in the presence of magnesium minerals like phosphorite, it will turn to stone in about two years. But in the Carbix X1 reactor, this happens in a matter of hours. We do this with a combination of heat, pressure, and UVC light. UVC is energetic enough to enhance reaction kinetics in much the same way that your dentist does when making a new tooth, then hardening it with light. So this data that I have to show you doesn't come from our X1 since it was in final assembly, but from our benchtop prototype. This was a low pressure and low heat test conducted over a three week period, our baseline tests. We sent the data to Bureau Veritas, a laboratory in British Columbia, Canada, where they performed an X-ray diffraction and thin section petrology test. The results showed a 30% uptake of CO2 in the form of magnesium and salt carbonates. The global market opportunity is a construction industry valued at nearly a trillion dollars. Cement and concrete is the second most used product in the world. The only thing we humans consume more is water. Our products are sustainable and re increase the life of concrete structures with shorter production time. It also, they also reduce salt accumulation, reduce water permeability, and more, most importantly, can eliminate nearly 80% of the emissions associated with cement making. We produce two primary product variants, magnesium and calcium carbonates and calcium oxides. The calcium oxides are for OPC. Portland cement is the primary ingredient selected by architects for structural 
and layout configurations. Now, while our reactor uses heat, pressure, mixing, and light energy, all of which will consume energy, it's important to note that our process is entirely carbon negative. And as a result, we can monetize our credits on exchanges like Pyrodite Earth. We can sink the carbonates into geological storage or storage in concrete. And we're also in discussion with several very prominent tech companies who want to purchase our credits, household names. And we have one more way that we'd like to monetize our carbonates. Right now, individual consumers have very few ways in which they can offset their own personal carbon footprint. But on our website, we will offer direct to consumers the opportunity to purchase individual carbon sequestration offsets. We believe that in year five, with estimated revenue of 100 million, we can be profitable. Managing that, we will have to manage our CO2 and ore costs, as well as energy costs with proprietary energy recovery devices that can eliminate or reduce 20% of our energy costs. At, this, at a scale of about 150 cubic meters, we can safely trap about 562,000 metric tons of CO2. In driving revenue are a mix of carbonate and oxide sales, as well as exchange and subscription revenue. And this is a team and partnership that will make that pilot project and our commercialization efforts a success. Dr. Vineet Deej is an expert in wind energy, fluid dynamics, and machine learning. He's developing fluid model solvers to enhance reaction kinetics. Sumit Desai is also a mechanical engineer by training, and he has been actively developing our business component, reaching out to multinational cement and concrete ready mix producers to bring them in as customers. Myself, I have over 10 years in clean tech design and engineering, and I lead our efforts in IP development, prototyping, and fundraising. We believe that the moment and opportunity for carbon use technology has arrived. Join us as a partner so that we can all ambitiously begin capturing and using CO2 with our technologies and create carbon negative societies. Thank you for your time and I can be reached at Johan Sammy at CarbonScore.com. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lindsay. Carbix is working along with Dan Gote, who is planning to put cement tiles in homes and kitchens across Nigeria. Check out the video at the bottom of the page and you can see the X1 reactor in operation. Be sure to book some time with Carbix if you get a chance. In recent years, cosmetics have introduced all kinds of molecules in attempts to boost skin health. But Sibley figured out that the solution is already on your skin. Next up, CEO Nicole is going to tell you about how powerful these natural compounds turned out to be. Hi, my name is Nicole Scott. I'm a geneticist and the CEO of Sibley. At Sibley, we're launching a skincare brand that brings precision control to the skin biome. Now, our skin is the largest organ. It protects us from the outside world. And our skin biome works in concert with our skin for our overall health and wellness. But the cosmetic products we apply can change this skin biome in unintended ways. Creams and lotions may feel great, but the increased lipophilic bacteria we don't actually want more of. The pH can change the population a lot. Plant ingredients can increase cyanobacteria. And the other compounds in there can shift microbial function and diversity. Now the challenge of bringing control to this is magnified by the fact that none of us have the same skin biome to begin with. At Sibylle, we think of your cosmetic products first and foremost as food for your skin biome. We don't use probiotics. We don't try to drown your skin in new microbes that don't belong. By controlling what your skin biome eats, we can control what they do. And we can have them do some really amazing things with specialized prebiotics. Let me give you an example. Ceramides are in nearly every cosmetic product on the market. They're a key player in skin health. 
They regulate key functions. They regulate cell proliferation, cell differentiation, cell death. But after the age of 20, natural ceramide production declines. Now, what the industry isn't telling you is that there's a huge difference between short-chain ceramides and long-chain ceramides. The long chains are the good ones. The short chains can actually harm your skin, fighting against the long chain versions. Your skincare products that advertise ceramides don't make this distinction and can be doing as much harm as good. But at Sibylee, we can give your skin those long chain ceramides by getting your skin biome to make them for you. Here's some data. Here's the prevalence of three important long chain ceramides. Just call them C1, C2, and C3 for short. This is not a measurement in our product. This is actually measured from a swab on a subject's skin. That's control, the good ceramides only. This is something the cosmetics industry can't do because to get ceramides in bulk, they're getting them from a random slush from the plasma of overweight dairy cows. Right now, we have our MVP product we created with a cosmetic formulator, and we're about to start a study with Proof Pilot out of New York City on 75 volunteers. We'll send them our serum and have them self-report on 30 variables over the course of 12 weeks. We'll also do skin microbiome metabolomics assessments. And in the meantime, I want to tell you a little bit about a study we did that we are insanely excited about. Now, after this two-week study, I had five individuals calling me, telling me about their reduction in psoriasis, eczema, inflammation. Someone even said they didn't have to use their prescription corticosteroid cream for the duration of the study. Now, not only did volunteers actually love the product, but we had a dermatologist read their before and after photos, and we saw a massive difference after just two weeks. So we saw everything in a reduction in erythema, wrinkles, hyperpigmentation, dermatitis. We even saw the reduction in a precancerous lesion. Now, we actually knew that one of our long-chain ceramides is a known anti-melanoma compound. But these results after two weeks have us totally floored. Our go-to-market strategy is to be a digitally native brand. We want to stay as close to the customers as possible. We'll launch a single hero product the beginning of next year and scale fast with two additional products. With that single hero product, we'll also do skin biome assessments. Our brand will own that space between the credible doctor brands and the newer delightful fun brands that have been successful. Those other SKUs I just mentioned, we already have those lined up. We have actually figured out how to make your skin biome create hyaluronic acid. That's the most common ingredient in anti-aging cosmetics. Because we have a platform behind what we do, we can make a host of complementary products. Now, when cosmetic companies put more ceramides or hyaluronic acid in their products, their margins get squeezed. But at Sibylle, we're not paying for those. They're made on your skin. So we'll have an 88% margin on a $120 bottle of serum. Our compounds are the product of microbial fermentation. We can buy them, and as we scale, have them made by CMOs without CapEx concerns. We filed patents in seven countries, and due to the strength of our PCT, have fast-tracked our US application. The team are experts in the microbiome, launching products and marketing, and we're expanding the team right now we are also supported by key opinion leaders in everything from consumer, direct-to-consumer, skin care, the microbiome, IP, and biotech. Several of these advisors believe in us so much, they're also investors. Join us in ushering in the future of skin health care. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you guys, thank you. Uh, well, you know, uh, oftentimes in cosmetics, uh, science takes a, a back seat, uh, which is why I'm actually super excited about the IRB that Sibley is, is doing um, and showing there's more there than, than just style. Um, and so introducing lib liberum, um, liberating uh, proteins and uh, 
I asked June a simple question when we first saw this team. Would we want a protein synthesizer in our own lab? And she said, yeah, we'd probably want three. So with that, Liberum. Thank you, Arvin. Thank you so much, Arvin. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I'm Aidan Tinafar, and I'm the CEO of Liberum Biotech. Three development tools drive the synthetic biology revolution today. These are DNA synthesis, sequencing, and protein expression. These technologies have allowed us to build the vibrant biomanufacturing ecosystem that we know today. But while DNA synthesis and sequencing have been addressed by giants like Twist and Illumina, protein expression remains a bottleneck in many labs. Our device aims to address this problem. Protein is far more than the food we eat. Proteins are heroes. Each discovery launches billion dollar industries. They are the keys to a sustainable future and the saviors of human health. So all over the world, scientists are busy engineering proteins to cure disease, make chemistry green, and replace plastics. The recombinant therapeutics market alone is now worth over $100 billion. But making protein is hard. For every idea, for every iteration, you have to re-engineer the genetics of living cells, grow them, break them open, and purify. This process is very hands-on, and you keep coming back to it over a week or two, and you need expertise and expensive equipment that take up a lot of space. Liberum automates the entire protein manufacturing process in a miniaturized device portable for any lab. Our system contains breakthroughs in microfluidics, purification techniques, and reagent storage. You can now make proteins in hours with a push of a button. That's at least 10 times faster than the conventional methods. We're making developer tools for protein synthesis to allow more bright ideas to see the light of day. Our business model is to sell this device to research labs along with accompanying cartridges at very affordable prices. Inspired by the ease of use of an espresso machine, we're making single-use cartridges that can be recycled after use. By having a razor razor blade model, we plan 85% of our revenue to be generated by selling the cartridges. Making the hardware affordable will lower the barrier to try our product while also encourage repeat purchases of the cartridges. Disruptions caused by COVID have highlighted the real need for our product, even for proteins that are available from traditional suppliers. Customers are demanding an app store for proteins, which we intend to build as we expand. We've made great strides in eliminating cross-contamination, minimizing dead volumes, and making the interface truly plug and play. So scientists in different labs are excited to get their hands on our technology, especially given how fast, simple, and affordable it is. We have a number of organizations who are eager to alpha test our product. People will be using our alpha prototype in their own labs within weeks. These include multiple academic labs, as well as startups and government organizations. Their use cases in structural biology, antibody discovery, and enzyme screening, just to name a few. In fact, as word of what we're doing is getting out, we already have multiple letters of intent totaling over $100,000. There are 6,000 molecular biology labs in North America today that are creating proteins, each of them spending a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on staff and reagents to do it. We are offering them a much better way. From our polling of these likely customers, they want to express three proteins a week on average. This adds up fast in revenue. Each lab would be spending $30,000 a year on cartridges, which would translate to $195 million in sales. But here's the thing. There are 64,000 additional molecular biology labs who aren't currently creating proteins. There are also non-molecular biology labs, like chemistry labs, who've shown interest in our technology. For most, creating proteins is beyond their capabilities today. But once it's as simple as pushing a button, far more labs will be making proteins. This is just our beachhead market. These researchers are on the cutting edge of science. Once they have validated our technology, we can then target large pharma and industrial biotech. Talking to these labs, what they're most excited about is having full control over their experiments at low cost to be liberated from the current processes. They can do it all in their own labs without having to wait on lead times for shipping samples to a CRO. Faster turnaround and ease of use translates into more discoveries and very little technical expertise is required to run our system. Our device can also make proteins that are toxic to cells, whereas traditional manufacturers are unable to do so in their cell-based platforms. We're moving fast to enable mass manufacturing 
We're designing for injection molding, scaling up our fermentation, and optimizing our strengths. Alpha testing in the next few weeks will lead to beta testing during our seed round and launching our product within a year before raising our Series A. We filed two US provisional patent applications to date. The technology portfolio covers biology, microfluidics, and hardware. We also plan on filing additional patents that would make it even more difficult to compete with us. Here's our team. Dr. Party is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Pharmacy at University of Toronto. He's the Canada researcher in synthetic biology. Ryan is a biomedical engineer, hardware expert, and serial entrepreneur. He's been involved in field testing of microfluidics devices around the world. And my master's program at the Party Lab focused on cell free protein expression and purification. I'm also a corporate lawyer. And having noticed the rapid fall in the cost of DNA synthesis, I knew synthetic biology is the next big wave. So I embarked on this journey. You also have an incredible advisory board. Dr. Druitt is a professor of chemical and biological engineering at Northwestern. He's the leading authority in cell free biology. Anyone interested in cell free is going to have confidence in what we're doing because of him being on board. Noah Joy Joyce was previously the head of design at Hacks and has years of experience working with companies turning their ideas into manufacturable goods. He's one of the key figures in building Hacks, a reputation for reliably making products. In 30 years, when we look back at the synthetic biology revolution, we want to be one of the things that accelerated that process. Please help us make protein manufacturing a push button process. Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, there's a great video down below on the page uh, for all the investors where Aiden talks about why he sees this as a benchtop device rather than a service in the cloud, though they can do both. And Aiden talks about more about the growth of this market. Now, I have Quincy with me here today. Quincy, how do you feel? Welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. Excited, pumped, anxious. So at the top of the show, we had a little intro video from all of the startups, workshops, and labs. I, I saw a little clip. I think it was you in that Darth Vader, or maybe it was Boba Fett outfit. What was going on there? So, yeah, that was me. Um, that was safety gear. It may have been a little bit over the top, but out of abundance of caution and working with UBC, um, we had some, I had some strict guidelines on what to wear. Thanks, Quincy. Thank you. Now, next up, we have Nisha Sarvaswaran, the CEO and co-founder of Kraken Sense. During the pandemic, the industrial sector showed us its flaws. We couldn't make ventilators. We couldn't make masks. We couldn't make toilet paper. And in the food sector, we had similar problems where hogs are being asphyxiated on farms because pork processing facilities had been shut down by contaminations. And then we had contaminations in red onions and in peaches and then in deli meats. And it's very clear in our industry today that the food supply chain needs better, faster ways to detect pathogens. We give you Kraken Sense. My name is Nisha Sarveswaran. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kraken Sense, and we are transforming the food supply chain. Food waste is responsible for 6% of the global greenhouse gases. 130 billion pounds of food is wasted each year, yet 815 million people go to bed hungry. The biggest issue is food safety. We have to ensure that the food that's on your plate is safe to eat but this causes millions of pounds of food to be wasted unnecessarily. In the US alone, pathogens in our food and water lead to over 300 recalls a year. These recalls are enormously complicated and can logistically take months. This is a $77 billion a year problem with 40,000 people being hospitalized. Pathogen contaminations don't just affect the company that has the outbreak, entire sectors are impacted. When a few spinach farmers had a problem in 2006, all growers suffered because produce price was cut in half. When it hit romaine lettuce last year, people were afraid to eat salads. And now we have a problem with red onions with 1300 people falling ill from salmonella contaminated red onions. Why is this happening in a modern world? It's because culture-based testing takes three days. In three days, produce and meat can already be distributed all over the continent. For a modern, just-in-time food distribution system, testing needs to be at the source in real time. It needs to be automated and strain-specific, 
since 90% of bacteria are harmless. Your farmer doesn't want to know that they have E. coli. They want to know what strain and what quantity they actually have. And that's where we come in. We built our Kraken, our lab on a chip system, to be a fully automated platform. It's based on our biome technology that enables us to detect what's actually in the water without culturing the bacteria. That means we can have it in line with the food production system. Contaminations can happen anywhere, from fertilizers that are not properly processed to irrigation canals that can have sewer leaks, and even in the processing plants where in the nooks and crannies of the system, bacteria can grow. The Kraken helps identify the source of the problem so that it can be solved immediately. Pathogen testing is vital in fish processing, meat processing, and to ensure the safety of our fruits and vegetables. We are sampling from the drain waters and the runoffs of the conveyor belt, irrigation systems, and washing stations. As the lettuce is getting washed, the washing water is pumped into the Kraken, where it's filtered, then concentrated, and then a small droplet is placed on our sensor automatically. An electrical signal is generated, and our machine learning system maps the output and analyzes the data. Immediately, you get a report that shows the actual bacterial count. If there's a problem, an SMS alert is sent to the production facility, and you're able to shut down and address the problem in real time. That means no recalls and outbreaks down the line, no negative press and brand damage, no reduced revenues, and most importantly, ensuring food safety. Our revenue model is based on Razor and Razor Blade press service. We have a $10,000 hardware unit, plus a one-time use sensor, which costs $3 per test along with a monthly subscription fee, and we have over 70% margin on our platform. The system automatically loads a sensor based on your testing schedule, and about once a month, you get a new set of sensors. Some customers will test every hour, while others will test once a day, depending on their needs. In the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing a controlled greenhouse trial in the Vishurin Center to finalize the automated unit. We will then move on to live customer trials at Noggins Corner in Nova Scotia. They're making cider and applesauce to add to their income stream, and we'll be showcasing our technology at the farm. We will learn from those trials and launch a full-scale Kraken, Kraken platform, first in California Central Valley with the demonstration of Fresno State University. This is the heartland of American food industry, and we're excited to show the results to the rest of the world. Then we will do a paid pilot with a water consortium in New Zealand to test for E. coli. Our go-to-market strategy initially isn't to replace existing three-day culture-based testing. It's to supplement it with instant automated testing. Pathogen testing market is over $10 billion, with 738 million tests performed a year. But this is a fractured market where everybody does their own testing with basic lab equipment. By offering a real-time inline testing, we will consolidate this market with time. Walmart announced that it wants to use blockchain technology to stop the spread of E. coli in their lettuce. Our sensor suite consists of pathogen tracking and sensors to detect the freshness, including ethylene gas, ozone, and ammonia to ensure that produce arrives at your table at the perfect ripeness. We also have a spectrometers that monitor the color of the produce paired with an AI database. We're using these sensor inputs to validate the food processed throughout the supply chain, and this is accessible instantly by the food retailers reducing food traceability timelines, and reducing food waste. We are building a distributed network of sensor suites that work with artificial intelligence to ensure the safety of produce across the supply chain. I'm an aerospace engineer with a background in nuclear safety. My co-founder, Jamal Zainalov, has a PhD in nanomaterials, and we built a team of, team of hardware engineers and machine learning experts, along with four postdoctoral fellows that are helping us develop this technology. We've been supported by the National Research Council of Canada, along with Milwaukee's Water Council, SOSV, McMaster University, and our advisors include the Dean of Engineering at McMaster University, who has a strong background in biotech, along with Sarge Green, who was the director of California's Water Institute. Lastly, we have a partnership with the manufacturing facility, the Microfactory, to help us manufacture the Krakens. We hope that you join us in this journey to a safer food and water environment. Thank you. Thanks, Nisha. Um, and as you heard, they're actually um, putting the first Kraken units in the field this coming month. So make sure to talk to Nisha to learn more about how those trials go, um, which we're really proud of because uh, getting work out into the field during the pandemic is definitely no easy feat. 
Um, so now I'm here with Nicole Scott, um, CEO of Sibley. Nicole, great pitch. Uh, how are you feeling today? Awesome. Having tons of meetings and hoping this drives even more interest to this whole skin health thing we're doing. Yeah, skin health. Um, yeah, so in the last five months, I'm curious, besides being here for Demo Day, what's been the most exciting uh, moment for you? Well, as part of Indie Bio, we actually did that small, short two-week study. I had people call me. I mean, it was incredibly impactful to see and hear from people the difference that our product made. made. And we didn't expect to have anything like that after two weeks. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Um, so here at Indie Bio, we funded um, dozens of companies that have used microbial fermentation to make their hero products. Um, and because of that, we've seen the challenge that both startups and industry have uh, in scaling up and maintaining high yields. So when we met the team from Asimica, we were really excited that they were solving a really fundamental challenge across the whole industry. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Nick, their CEO, to tell you more about that. Thank you, Alex. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Nick. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Asimica. We all know microbes, and we know stem cells. But you may not realize that microbes do not form stem cells. During my PhD, I made an innovation of microbial stem cells. This invention opens new avenues in the market of microbial fermentation technologies. I was always fascinated by the power of fermentation as a new way of manufacturing of goods for people. It uses cells as factories grown in bioreactors. Genetic engineering enables the cells to produce products of the future, pharmaceuticals and fuels, artificial foods and new materials, and many, many more. It is a massive market, over 150 billion now, expected to double by 2025. But despite all advances in science, the real green revolution in production is still largely a dream. So why is that? Biofactories, unlike traditional factories, cannot operate nonstop. Every few days, the production has to be shut down. Each restart of the process is time consuming and expensive, leading to 20 to 40% downtime lost. And this is limiting economic efficiency of biomanufacturing. The reason is that microbes inside bioreactors are suffering from the stress of production. They've been genetically engineered to make protein products, but like any worker, they break down and get old and they accumulate mutations. It gets to a point where they cannot produce anymore. So many biotech companies are aiming to extend production lifetime in their bioreactors. A lot of genomic tricks were designed into microbes to make them stronger, more productive, more resistant to toxicity and mutations. But while you can keep your workers more fit, you cannot make them young again. They are getting old, it's genetics. What I'm going to tell you about today is an ultimate way to help this situation. At Asimica, we invented a method to repopulate biofactory with new workers during the process. We are doing it using our innovation of microbial stem cells. Much like human stem cells, which keep our fun tissues functional for decades, microbial stem cells are constantly replenishing the fraction of young and productive microbes inside bioreactor. But I said before that microbial stem cells do not exist, or they could did not exist before a semicon. We know from school that microbes divide into two identical twins. During my PhD, I found a way to make the cell division asymmetric. That explains the name of our company. In this image, you can see asymmetrically divided cells, marked with red, generating new green young factory cells. Red cells have stem cell properties. Microbial stem cell technology is a new idea, and the Simica is the first company that designed its principles. And we are protecting our innovation. Our non-provisional patent was published a year ago. I published scientific principles of this work in the Nature Chemical Biology Journal. The follow-up publication on mathematical modeling of our systems is in press. Our models suggest the highest impact of our technology for production of molecules which are highly toxic for the host cells and are most challenging for the industry. During our time in IndieBio, we have experimentally simulated this situation. We are making a protein called GP61. It's used in poultry and nutrition fields, and it's toxic for very bacteria which are making it. In our trials, we observed that in conventional cultures, after 20 hours of production course, majority of cells were broken down like exploded. At the same time, 
in presence of microbial stem cells, the culture was still healthy and producing. In subsequent 20 hours of production, conventional cultures almost stopped making any product, so the cells lost their potential for production. In presence of stem cells, the culture was still actively making a product. It is an early indication of the potential impact of our technology. And we are testing it on production of other industrial products. That includes a jojoba oil, a valuable product in the cosmetics market. You can see yellow cells in the left photo, which are making it. We are also making insulin because it's such a huge market in the pharma industry. Other trials we have are with enzymes used in the food industry. Chymosine is necessary for making cheese from milk. Xylosazomeris is used for making high fructose corn syrup. And here we also observe significantly high protein yields using our method. We are approaching our future customers. We are already in the early stage partnership with a large German company, which is using E. coli for production of drugs and food ingredients. A dozen of other companies are waiting for our scientific updates, mainly on scaling up our experiments and transferring our technology to other fermentation platforms. In these partnerships, we are a B2B strain engineering company. We can enable strains of our partners with stem cell properties, increasing their productivity. We are asking partners for a flexible percent royalty of top line of their production, in return boosting their profits. Imagine a company making 100 million revenue from one product. A half of it can be a cost of production. Our service can decrease the cost of production and increase their margins and the royalties for a simica would be calculated out of the delta we provide. We expect to become revenue positive in two years from now. In the next nine months, we'll continue optimizing our system, scale up our experiments and execute trial contracts. Once we de-risk our science, we'll be raising a seed round to hire more trained engineers and fermentation scientists to speed up transfer of our technology to other fermentation platforms, bacteria, yeast and filamentous fungi. I got my education and early career experience back in St. Petersburg, Russia. Then I moved to Wyoming to do PhD in Dr. Grant Bowman's lab. That ended up launching a company. Dr. Grant Bowman is a well-recognized scientist in the field of microbiology. Jacob Guidry was in our lab for over six years, starting as an undergraduate fellow, continuing as a PhD student, and then joining a simica. We also have support from a board of advisors including Dr. Nathan Hilson from Joint Bioenergy Institute, Dr. Andrew Lamukov Advai from Berkeley National Lab, Dr. Mark Gamelsky, who is actually co-inventor of microbial stem cells, and Todd Slaby, a consultant who helped us to connect with industrial partners. We are welcoming everyone interested to join us in this exciting journey of creating a new age of microbial fermentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nick. Uh, you know, when we first funded Nick, he had invented the microbial stem cells and only mathematically estimated what that would do. It's so exciting that during IndieBio, he and Grant and Jacob have made that come real in so many different products. To all the investors out there, but actually to all of the community, even non-investors, to mentors, to fans out there, to members of the media, I want to remind you, if you're watching, that at the end of this show, we have two more pitches left. We'll be moving to the Rally platform. We'll, we'll flash that link at the end of the show. And you're all welcome to join us in our community event over there. Now for our next startup, at IndieBio, we have seen many waste-of-value companies, and we have launched several. But one of the hardest challenges is sorting waste itself, which is nearly impossible in the real world. So we've longed for a technology that will allow society to valorize and to upcycle its waste, all, even, even mixed waste, all of its waste, in a single process. And with that, we bring you Kepra. Hi, my name is Julie Kring, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kepra. We crack carbon-carbon bonds in plastic and organic waste in order to release hydrocarbons to replace fossil fuel. By 2035, the largest corporate producers of waste have promised to be net zero. 
However, our recycling technology is not sufficient in order to achieve these goals. So, at IndieBio, we built a chemical reactor. In, a in our continuous flow ultrasonic reactor, waste goes in and fuels come out. Our fuel can be sold anywhere, today, at an existing refinery, even in small amounts. We do not have to achieve economies of scale in order to, to commercialize this technology. Today, there's a $2 billion market for equivalent advanced fuels in comparison to the multi-trillion dollar global market for pet petrochemicals. And with inline catalytic refinement, we can produce a more stable, higher quality, and diversified product, opening doors to new markets. A barrel of oil, sorry, a ton of oil is worth $273. But with sonocatalysis, we can create a product which is worth $1,000 to $1,500 per ton. This is a 4x valorization of the original product. We started with a batch reactor that used a low power, high energy, sorry, high power, low frequency sound. And we processed multiple materials in this system. Then we moved on to a continuous flow reactor that used high intensity focused ultrasound. Moving forward, we will build a multi-frequency system that is also continuous flow and is optimized at the benchtop scale. This information will provide us with the basis for building a minimum commercializable volume of about 500 liters. This is 1,000x the scale of our prototypes. This minimum commercializable volume will be multi-frequency, again, will be fully optimized, and will have a high feed rate in order to demonstrate the commercializability of this technology. We're using HIFU, which means that we're efficient. We have a high energy return on energy invested. For every one unit of energy we put in, we get 3.6 to 18 units of energy out. This is because we have a high energy transfer to the system. Our electrical to acoustic power conversion is 80 to 90%, which gives us a huge leg up on existing renewable fuels. And recirculation of the residual oil reduces the cost of solvent and creates a zero waste system. Multiple materials have produced the same results across experiments, C14 to C20 alkanes. We've tested high density polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, and mixed waste in the form of a sole of a shoe. We, in the future, will test low density polyethylene, PET, and a variety of lignocellulosic wastes. Aromatics and components of JP Yet jet fuel have shown up in our GCMS analytics. Aromatics can be used as solvents, precursors to pharmaceuticals, and can boost the octane in existing gasoline and diesel engines, as well as the C14 aromatics can be used in jets, as well as rockets. Our go-to-market is to make fuel from waste on the way to the landfill. We will take residual waste from a materials recovery facility, which we are paid a tipping fee. We will make a slurry of this waste, pass it through a series of our minimum commercializable volume reactors, fractionate the valuable products and sell those as an offtake, and recirculate the lower grade residual oil. And this can all be accomplished in the footprint a size of a brewery. By working with renewable electricity partners, we can cut our costs dramatically and share in the revenue of generating a renewable electricity. We can arbitrage surplus energy during the middle of the day when there's an oversupply and use it to produce gases and fuels to generate electricity at night. Between 4 and 8 p.m., California frequently experiences rolling blackouts, and this is because of something called the duck curve. As I mentioned before, we have an oversupply of energy in the middle of the day, and we can't supply enough energy at night. We're solving this problem by reducing curtailment for our solar partners and ending negative pricing. Our business model brings together multiple streams of revenue. We're paid a tipping fee for the waste that we collect. We're paid for the energy that we provide to the grid. And we're paid for the offtake agreements that we source with refineries and chemical distributors such as BASF, Dow, and Sigma Aldrich. From a high level, Kepra is sonochemistry. We're a renewably powered platform for a plethora of applications. We're a marketplace for renewable energy and carbon offsets, which are generated with the fuel that we produce, and a solution for corporates looking to achieve net zero waste and regenerate the environment. We have a long-term IP strategy covering the process, hardware, and catalysis, with provisionals filed on the process and the hardware. I'm Julie Kring. 
CEO of Kepra. I have a background in biochemistry and experience leading large teams on political campaigns. My co-founder, Madeline, whom I've known for over a decade, has a background in physics and experience in engineering at Lockheed Martin and the Leibniz Institute for Materials. We're working with consultants with decades of experience in chemical engineering and energy market modeling. And our advisors include Vikas Vinayak and Rob Modest, who collectively have decades of experience in early stage hardware development and scale up. In addition to that, we're working with Daria Bafido, a professor at Montreal Polytechnic, through whom we've organized a one year research contract to model optimal ge reactor geometry and create lignocellulosic fuel. I welcome you to join me in solving not one, but two of the biggest global problems facing us today, our mountains of waste and our need for clean, renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Kepra is truly a Silicon Valley startup story, having tinkered in their garage before coming to IndieBio with a plan and a dream. The Capra team has done an amazing job building their proof of principle prototypes, getting data, and developing their business model in such a short time. Finally, we come to the last pitch of the day. I had mentioned at the beginning that we invested in two fertility companies. The idea of turning skin cells into eggs, or in vitro gametogenesis, is something that I, many women, and those who cannot have biological children have been hoping for. But even experts would tell you that this is impossible today. Then we met Jeff and Colin from Ivy Natal, who had a novel approach and a technical plan. It's a very indie bio thing to take a shot on something seemingly impossible and make it inevitable. Take it away, Colin. Thank you so much, June, for that kind introduction. I am Colin Bortner, one of the co-founders of IV Natal. Right now, many women cannot have children except through the use of donor eggs. This can be due to previous cancer treatment, age, or other factors. And each donor IVF cycle is the result of a complicated donor-patient matching process, which ultimately can cost patients tens of thousands of dollars or more. And at the same time, Donor eggs are an incomplete solution. They're used in circumstances where there is no alternative that would help, children, uh, help women and families have genetic children. Our aim is to replace the entire egg donation process with a simple skin biopsy, and at the same time, help many women and families fulfill their desire to have genetic children. In short, we aim to transform a patient's own skin cells into new healthy egg cells for use in IVF procedures. This is an example of in, in vitro gametogenesis, or IVG, which just means creating eggs or sperm outside of the body. IVG was first demonstrated in mice four years ago by researchers at the University of Kyoto, but there remain enormous challenges to translating their approach to humans and further to commercializing and scaling it. For that reason, we are developing an alternative approach to IVG called direct reprogramming. The key insight behind direct reprogramming is that all of the cells in our body share the same genes, and all that distinguishes one cell type from another is which of those genes are being read and turned into proteins. Direct reprogramming technologies have been used with a wide variety of cell types, including neurons, Leydig cells, and uh, liver cells, um, which has allowed uh, researchers to produce these cell types uh, with greater efficiency and on shorter timescales than alternative approaches. The application of direct reprogramming to in vitro gametogenesis is so new and so exciting that it's attracted leading researchers to our work. We are advised by George Church at the Harvard Medical School, and we are collaborating on our reprogramming system with Dr. Stanley Chi's lab at the Stanford School of Medicine. There are two engineering challenges that we are solving to apply direct reprogramming to IVG. The first is avoiding DNA changes while reprogramming our cells. And the second is discovering the gene targets to produce new human egg cells. I'll briefly describe our solutions to those two challenges. First, all practical reprogramming systems today can cause changes to a cell's DNA, which would be absolutely unacceptable to patients and to regulators. That's why we are developing modified CRISPR proteins into a safe reprogramming system, which is incapable of introducing genome changes. 
Our starting point is, is uh, CRISPR activation and interference proteins, which we are producing in our lab and are already modified to not cut DNA. Then we are going one step further by developing an alternative delivery system for our proteins into the cells, which avoids all of the risks of genome modification inherent in established uh, delivery systems. Second, we are using large sequencing data sets and machine learning methods to find our targets. We're using data and machine learning to predict our gene targets, testing those targets with our CRISPR system, and then measuring the results with sequencing. Those results then feed back into our predictions and our target selection. In other words, we are moving through the search space of cell types with a map and a compass. We always know where we are and where we are going. What may not be obvious is how a startup could tackle this problem. These three charts show the exponential declines in the costs of computing power, gene synthesis, and DNA sequencing. These are the three core inputs to our business and proxies for other core inputs to our business. These exponential technology improvements are why our approach is not just possible, but it's practical. I wanna talk now about our progress. We are working on four major milestones which progressively de-risk our business. They are first, building a safe reprogramming system. Second, validating that system. Third, building a prototype, specifically applying our approach to producing primordial germ cells, which are a progenitor of egg cells. And finally, building our product, new healthy human egg cells. We are a brand new company. We started work three months into lockdown, but already we have achieved two of our milestones and we're making swift progress on our third. The fertility services market is forecasted to reach $36 billion this decade. Donor eggs alone are a multi-billion dollar market globally, and the, our product would be a categorical improvement over the status quo, allowing us to capture that existing demand while retaining 90% margins or more. At the same time, the number of egg banking cycles has grown exponentially. That represents the enormous unmet demand for new and better solutions to preserve and restore fertility, which is demand that our product could additionally capture. I wanna talk a little bit about our team. My co-founder Jeff Shu is our CSO. He has a PhD in molecular medicine from Case Western, did his postdoc in genetics and genomics at the Cleveland Clinic, and most recently led uh, bioinformatics for a pre-implantation genetic testing startup. Um, <laughs> for, uh, I'm coming from uh, uh, almost 10 years with Netflix, where I most recently led public affairs for the company's international expansions. My experience building teams, solving ho new hard regulatory problems, all in a fast-growing business, are all transferable to this company's mission. Finally, my colleague Shivani Pandey most recently joined us from the biomedical engineering program at Johns Hopkins. She is so passionate about what we are building together that she relocated cross country during a global pandemic. As I mentioned, we are primarily advised by George Church at the Harvard Medical School. George is a pioneer in the field of synthetic biology and he and his, labs, uh, and he and his lab are uh, leaders in particular on cellular reprogramming and CRISPR systems. We have also benefited enormously from the support of our partners, investors, and collaborators who have all put our business on a firm foundation and helped us progress and scale incredibly fast. Right now, we are building a prototype. After we finish that, we intend to raise a seed round to support building our product. We are looking for partners who want to help us revolutionize human fertility and make the world a better, more just, and more equitable place. If you'd like to learn more, please don't hesitate to contact us. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Colin. Uh, there's a great video down below where Colin addresses a key question, which is how this can be done on a startup's timeline and budget. Julie, you just presented. Great job. It's very exciting what Carepo's doing. How do you feel? Great. Now, you and Arvin share an avocation, which is climbing. How does navigating the risks of a climb uh, teach you anything about navigating the risks of a startup? Yeah, so climbing, like pretty much all outdoor activities, is based in self-reliance and commitment. So if you get into a situation, you have to get out of it by yourself. It's your complete responsibility. 
Uh, and Arvind's really adamant about the first rule of startups, which is don't die. So you can see the parallels. Great. Hey, we have Colin. Colin, come on over here. Let's just step aside for a sec. Thank you. Colin, uh, thank you. Great pitch. Thank you. Very excited what you're doing. Uh, we have a lot of founders who could not be here today. It wasn't yeah. pragmatic at all to be here. So I know you talked to the whole batch a lot. Mm -hmm. On behalf of those who couldn't be here and yourself, could you offer a few comments? Sure. Uh, well, I think it's undoubtedly, uh, undoubted, undoubtedly, we did not expect to have the summer that we had. When we all accepted our offers from IndieBio, uh, we did not think that we would be facing this uh, global pandemic. And I think the hardships that we faced uh, have really provided a common foundation for us and, and allowed us to bond in a way that I think may not have happened had we all just flown to San Francisco as usual. Um, and I think that there's also some real advantages for us because we've really learned how to connect with people remotely. And so for uh, IndieBio's portfolio companies, which are located all over the world, that means we can connect with investors everywhere. So I, I personally have had opportunities to connect with investors all over the world, and I know many of our batchmates do. So even if they're outside of California, they can uh, make those connections. So both a lot of hardship, but there's some upside. Great. Thank you, Colin. Thanks very much. Now, uh, investors out there, I know you have a lot of interest in these companies. Investors from all around the world do. In addition to booking time with their CEOs, uh, there's a button down the page. You can book time with me or our team here in San Francisco. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about these companies. We are committed to all of them, and we'll be continuing to invest in them as they grow. And uh, if you want to email me uh, on the IndieBio.co website, on my page is my email. In fact, why don't you just text me? Um, I prefer for you to text me for investors only. So here's my number. Do you have a pen? Get your pen ready. It's 415-699-4020. 415-699-4020. You can text me. We can chat about our companies. It's okay. I've been a public person for many decades. <laughs> Next up, before we part, I want to introduce a very special person. Sean O'Sullivan is the managing general partner of SOSV. He is our leader. He is incredible to work with, a great friend, lots of fun, and he's a true humanitarian. Sean O'Sullivan. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone, uh, Poe and, and everyone there. And I still think it's insane that you're giving everyone your cell phone number, <laughs> no matter what. But um, hey, um, so 2020, what a year. <clears throat> uh, 2020 has shown us how significant and important biology and science are for our survival and for our society's ability to function. Um, it's never been clearer that biology is both um, an opportunity and a threat for humanity and our planet. Um, I, am, uh, I was born in the 60s, and in my lifetime, uh, there's never been a more catastrophic year than 2020. Um, and many of our challenges have come from our leadership's inability to either recognize or to take seriously the unstoppable force of science um, or to deploy science and engineering to prevent these threats from harming our society. You know, as an enemy, uh, science is an undefeatable opponent. We've seen this with COVID, we've seen this with the forest fires in California, with global warming. However, if we harness it, science becomes an unforgettable friend. And today you saw companies with a remarkable set of solutions for severe challenges in human and planetary health. These are solutions that will bring life to the childless, improve treatments for cancer and for our biomes. that will tackle sustainability through improvements to our water and food uh, systems, our fabrics, and improve efficiencies in recycling and, and in protein farming. When you think about these problems, they're all fundamental to our daily lives and our daily health. We all eat food. We all have to fight off dysbiosis and cancers. We, all, we are all dependent every day on a sustainable, healthy environment. So thank you to all of these founders, all of our founders, for showing us paths towards what tomorrow can look like. I'd love to give them a round of applause. <laughs> I think the mics are off, but, but the, I'm sure that around the world, uh, you're all cheering. So, but if you wanna make a difference uh, in creating more order in the chaos, 
or providing light in a path towards a brighter future, you've come to the right place. Science is king here at IndieBio. You know, companies that IndieBio has backed in past years and in this year have already risen to the challenge. SOSV's portfolio has 40 companies that are actively fighting COVID, ranging from small molecule therapeutics to antibody therapeutics, laboratory automation, robotics, disinfecting technologies, medical devices, all across the board. These companies are the first responders that, that dove in, dashed into the burning building in the early months of the pandemic, while many of us were forced to work at home. So, together, the, these SOSV startups that pivoted to COVID are shipping hundreds of millions of dollars of testing solutions and medical equipment already. There are at least five of our startups that are now active in clinical trials, all responding to these events in real time in record time, just in these last eight months. And it's because of your investment, of your investment, uh, that this has been possible. SOSV is the parent VC behind IndieBio, and we've been supporting entrepreneurs that are tackling the serious problems of the physical world for the past 10 years through Hacks, IndieBio, and our other accelerators. But we can't do it alone. For every 25 million we put into IndieBio startups, about 500 million comes in from you. Uh, from the investors that attend our demo days and follow on into these startups in the years after they graduate this program. Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, tells us that even in unbelievably difficult times, we can rise above. We can paint a, a picture of future that is better than today, and we can take steps toward reaching that future. I'm asking you to recognize the scientific discoveries you've seen today are also commercially viable. And I'd like to ask your support in funding these companies. You will do well by investing in the bio companies, but also importantly, you will, you will create the world that you want to live in of greater abundance and greater equity. There's a through line between the companies you see today and a more sustainable world. The through line is your actions. So please sign up to meet with the companies you believe you can help. In several cases, these rounds will be oversubscribed, but they can use your support in the years to come. So use the links below to grab slots of time with these startups in the next two weeks. And please take the time today, as Gandhi says, to be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you. Now to all the investors out there, this link, this URL at the top of the page, you can share that around your firm, and if you come back, perhaps by later this evening or certainly by tomorrow, you'll be able to re-watch the pitches in addition to all the goodies down below. And for the transition to the platform for the community event, Wesley? Hi everyone, so all of you guys are watching this from all over the world, and we wanna give you guys the opportunity to come and just meet each other face to face. So we've set up a networking platform using this place called rally.video, and um, we've set up different rooms that range from you know industrial biology to uh, climate change, and even just meet the founders here. Now, everyone that you've seen here today, and everyone that you saw yesterday at New York's Demo Day, We'll be at this networking session, and Rally is just a place where you can float around from room to room, from table to table, and just meet as many people as you can. It's really fun, we've tried it, and we're really excited to share that with you. So that link is going to be, uh, we're gonna leave that link up um, right after all this, and we're just gonna leave it up for 10, 15 minutes so you don't forget it, and uh, yeah. That's and Wesley, we're going to, the, to, to Rally at top of the hour. Yeah. Top of the hour so at noon. That's when we'll be there. Great. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. It was a great day today. Woo! Woo!